The lesson today is about Anders Zorn and his limited palette. He worked with four colors, which included white. And you'll see, if you look him up on Wikipedia, that he was able to do phenomenal things with this very limited palette. Here you can see he's left us a portrait of himself with the white, yellow ochre, vermilion, and ivory black. I'm going to attempt to paint this image that he painted. He did a beautiful job. It's very delicate. The values are fantastic. And I'm going to use the palette that I use now. And uh, that consists of titanium white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and ivory black. Now he used vermilion, as far as we know, and the vermilion's not as permanent. It actually darkens over time. So cadmium red is really the preferred color. Uh, now it's modern, it's easily accessible, and I prefer this one. So with just this limited range, we'll see if we can imitate what he's done. So the mixes that you can get from this are quite phenomenal because you'll notice there isn't a blue here, but because ivory black has uh, a fair bit of blue in it, uh, it is the alternative to blue. It grays, of course, uh, when you add in white, and uh, that neutralizes color. So most color is the property of light. So the shadow areas are less critical than the light areas. And I'll just give you an idea as to the kind of color mixes that you can get um, with this limited palette. In a perfect world, what you should do is really create a grayscale, taking your black and your white, and create a set of 10 grays from dark to light, uh, from black, of course, all the way up to light, with a good sense of difference in each gray that you create so that there's a uniformity between the dark and the light. And I really highly recommend this because not only does it train you for your values, uh, it gives you a sense of the uh, range that you can get between these two colors. Of course, black and white are extreme. And somewhere in the middle, roughly around a five, if you were to break it into 10, you'll find your cadmium red. And your yellow ochre, of course, is a little lighter than that. It's, it's leaning more towards the white. So it's important to understand your values, and values, frankly, are more important than color. Uh, you can get away with poor color, even, if your values are correct. Um, so that's something to think about. Try and get your values right. So let's have a look at the mixes here. I like to take my white first and mix into the white. Because when I do that, it takes very little color in order to uh, change uh, that, that uh, very little white to, to make a color that uh, has a less or more intensity. So taking the white and adding in just a little bit of the yellow, you'll see it's a very little bit. I've got a nice warm, and when I say warm, it's yellow, but it's a cool yellow. If I want to make that yellow, it's almost a flesh color of sorts, you'll see it doesn't match my hand, but if I want to make that a little warmer, all I have to do is bring in a little bit of cad red, and you see a little bit of cadmium red goes a long, long way. And that's really a closer mix to the kind of color I am. Some people lean more towards the yellow, and some people lean more towards the red. If I take those two colors right there and add white to either one of those colors, you'll notice that I've mixed some red in, of course, to this yellow. I'm just going to get a very light, pale skin tone right here. You see how light that is? 
and it's towards the pink side. Of course, if I take white and mix that into the yellow side, it's a very subtle difference. But these are the differences that you see in Zorn's work. Of course, I'm going to lighten that even more to bring it up to the same value. So you can see it by color beside each other. That's the pinker color. This is a more yellow color here. And of course, there are colors in between the two of those. If you were to mix those together, you'd have something that uh, really takes part of both of those. Uh, a little bit warmer because of the red, a little cooler because of the yellow and white. And these are very subtle changes. And these are the kind of changes when you look at Zorn's work that make his painting so remarkable, considering the limited palette that he has. So I'm going to bring in just a little bit of gray. So I'm going to take this titanium white, and I'm going to mix a very light gray. I don't need very much of this color. I probably have too much there, so I'll mix a little bit more white into that. and create a very pale gray. And see what happens when I take that gray, which is almost the same. It's a little darker. I'll make it lighter. I'm going to bring in the same. It's good to work when you're mixing one color into another and you're trying to create color change. It's really good to have the same value. When I put that value beside this one now, see so you have a very pale gray. And if you were to squint down at that, you'll notice that they're pretty much in the same value range. So if I take a little bit of that gray and I add that to my yellow mix there, you'll see I have a very subtle change in color. It's become cooler and grayer. And if I do that to the other side over here where we have that pink, I'll just mix it over here, it's easier to see. You'll notice that I have a grayer pink. It's less intense, uh, less chroma. So suddenly you have these two colors to work with. Now just in that range alone, uh, you can create lots of subtle changes in the light areas of your, your portrait uh, or your skin tones. So I've used very little paint in order to get that broad range of color right there. And a lot of those colors you may see in light, perhaps not so much the gray, unless you're painting, say, a gray fabric. If I was painting a gray fabric with warmer lighting on that gray fabric, I might bring in a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. And when you mix red and yellow, of course, you get an orange. So that's the kind of orange that you would get from this palette. I could create a stronger orange with a little more red that would be a little warmer. But let's see what happens when I take white and add it into this. It's interesting because what I've done is I've mixed something again, it's in the same family. I haven't brought any gray into it, but it's in the same family as these here, of course, because they're the same mix. I can take gray and add that into this now. And I end up with a very neutral, just shifting here a little. Uh, I create a very neutral middle value, or maybe a little higher than a middle value of a 5, which would be your red. I can create some very dark shadow areas. Of course, it makes sense to go into your black. Straight black isn't a great idea. I always like to bring some color into it. 
and just a little bit of red into that black, you can see that that warms it up. I don't know how subtle uh, a color that you can see when we're filming this. Uh, but if I put straight black beside that now, you may see that. If I bring a little bit more red into that one on the other side here, let's just see what happens. This is going to be fairly obvious now. There we go. It's still a dark, it's still a very dark value, but it has some life in it because there's some color there. Black really kills your color, so be careful with black. In fact, the Impressionists rarely, if ever, used black. That was sort of a rule. Um, someone like John Singer Sargent, who was a tonalist, insisted on using black, ivory black, and, you know, he painted well with it. But Monet, of course, didn't have black in his palette. So you can create some great darks without involving black. But for Zorn's palette, uh, this was essentially the blue. And it seems sort of strange to say that that's the blue, but if you take this gray that I mixed up, let's just put some over here. The complement to blue, of course, is orange. So if I make an orange out of this yellow ochre and this cadmium red, and I surround this gray that you see, with this orange, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this right up against that gray. Let's see if we can get this on all four sides, or at least three. That definitely has a cool look to it. Let's put some black up against that as contrast on this side here. That's as blue or as cool as you can go with Zorn's palette. Now and then he would use blue, but for the most part he stuck to his very limited palette <clears throat> of titanium white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and ivory black. <clears throat> You can get a huge range of values and intense color, surprisingly intense color, when you start working just with those mixes. If I want to get a very rich, dark shadow in an area, and I want it to have some chroma, I can bring a lot of red into that. I can add some more yellow into that if I want to lighten the value and bring more color and create a rich, almost, if you look at this, it almost looks like a burnt sienna. For a lot of artists, they'll reach for burnt sienna. And this is just proof that you don't have to. You, you can work with this limited palette. Of course, burnt sienna is a, maybe a little more intense, but because everything what we're doing here is within a harmony of sorts, you're guaranteed that you're going to have color harmony within your painting. And this is a broad range of color and value within a very limited range of colors. Uh, let's just see what happens when we take that uh, burnt uh, sienna kind of color that we've mixed and just add white to that. And let's see what that looks like. You can see, when I put that now against these colors here, the difference that you get in the warmth here. And that we've used ivory black and cadmium red in order to get it, but because of the cadmium red, that's kept it warm. I can add a little bit more red to that, and suddenly you have this beautiful 
color that comes up that looks like something that uh, you would find in someone who's flushed or, you know, someone who's just been running outdoors in their cheeks or some such thing. So there's a great range of color here. I would suggest if you want to get to know this palette really well, experiment with it. Uh, use your ivory black, cadmium red, yellow ochre, and your white to create value scales. Start with your black, create a black uh, from black to white in a value scale, this way of 10 values. Do the same with your red, but your red will start as a pure color somewhere in here, if you were to break this down, uh, and then add black to it to go darker, white to it to go lighter, and of course that's going to give you a pink. As soon as you add white to red, that gives you pink. It's no longer red anymore. Do the same with your yellow ochre, and the value of your yellow ochre is going to be higher, closer to the white, and create a scale. Bring your um, value in the yellow down with your black, and that gets us to this last little section here, which is what uh, what will happen when we take yellow ochre, mix in ivory black. We don't have blue, so the closest that we can get to green is something along this line. So I've actually got a green here. Because of the blue that's in the ivory black, this gives me a green. It's not a very exciting green. It's not something you would use for a spring day when the leaves are just starting to come out and the sun shining through. But it is a beautiful green that we see in nature a lot. It's a very neutral green. And interestingly, we also see those greens in our face as well. Those are the kinds of colors that help planes turn away towards the shadow area. If I were to take a color like that and put it between these two colors here, you'll see that that is a color that could be a transition color from warm into a little cooler, um, or maybe it's into a shadow. So if I were to create a shadow, I want to take a shadow, this is a little intense, I can create a shadow with that color and bring in a little more ivory black and suddenly have a nice range of both value and chroma change into a shadow area. So from warm to a little cooler and if this were actually in light, if this was a color that was in light for example, I would want to keep it lighter than I have here. So add a little bit of white to that, and you can see how it goes from light here to a value change that's a little cooler, more neutral, and into a shadow area there. There are a lot of subtleties that you can create with this particular palette. So there it is. Um, I'm going to do a time lapse and I'm going to give it my best shot to uh, replicate or maybe imitate an Anders Hazorn painting and let's see how that goes. Hopefully you've learned something from this and uh, I hope I'll see you back here again. Thanks.